Okay, then let's start with uh, the deep end of Scala 3 by starting with macros. So we're going to, to have a look at, at a few different parts of the macros. We're first going to, to have a, a, a look back at Scala 2 macros and why we had to change them and what is the difference and relation between Scala 2 and 3 macros. Then we're going to go into the inline features, which is what supports the Scala 3 macros. Then we're going to go into the actual Scala 3 macros. And then we're going to go into the reflection, which is the extension that allows the macros to be as powerful as Scala 2 macros. So Scala 2 and 3 macros started because we had some, some design issues with uh, the Scala 2 macros. The, the first problem is we couldn't port them easily to, to the new compiler. And that was in part because the architecture of the, of, the, of the Scala 2 macros was tightly coupled with the internals of the Scala 2 compiler. So it proved impossible to just reuse the same um, macro system. Another thing was that the because it's tightly coupled with the internals of the compiler, it's a quite complex API. So we wanted to provide something simpler. Um, so when we started the, the Scala 3 macros, we, we had as design goals to, to make the API of the macros completely independent from the compiler and to make sure that we didn't have those uh, interoperability issues. We also wanted to make sure that the complexity of writing a macro would not would scale with the, with the complexity of the kind of code that we want to write. So if you want to write a, sim a, a, a simple code generator, then it should not be hard to, to write it. Well, if you want to really write something quite complex, it should be possible to do it. And the last thing is that we use a tasty file format that we use for a binary representation of high-level Scala programs in Scala 3, also as a compatibility layer between macros and the compiler. So this ensures that we will be able to port it to next versions of Scala. So let's go a bit into the features that we have in Scala 2 and Scala 3. So there, is, there, are, there were the black box macros and the white box macros. Um, we support both kinds of macros in Scala 3 as well. There have, they have different names. In Scala 3, we call black box macros just inline macros. And uh, white box macros are called transparent inline macros. We're going to go into a bit more detail on that later. Then there are some features that were dropped, um, like the ability to type a program uh, or, or type part of the code at the use site after in, uh, 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 where, where the ma macro is expanded. That proves to be quite challenging to, to, to use correctly for the macro authors because they need to reason about the, the call site of the macro as well as the macro implementation itself. So instead, we, we provide a much strong, uh, a simpler abstraction that provides stronger guarantees and will help us build um, um, more, um, more stable macros in the future. And the, the last thing that many people ask for is what about annotation macros? So currently we don't have them, but the, the system has been designed to make sure that we could add them at, at some later version of the, of the compiler. Meanwhile, it's possible to use a plugin for to do those things, and we'll see how fast we can get those in the main compiler. So in general, the if you want to migrate from Scala 2 to Scala 3, it's fairly easy because Scala 2.13 and Scala 3 are mostly binary compatible. Just some corner cases or where when you use the some Scala 3 features that Scala 2 doesn't know, then of course you will not be binary compatible. But as long as you use the features that are in both, then we're fine, except for macros, of course. So the problem is that Scala 3 cannot expand Scala 2 macros and Scala 2 macros and Scala 2 cannot expand Scala 3 macros. So what can we do if we are, for example, migrating a project? If you, you have a project using Scala 2 macros, you might have something like this, where you actually had to cross compile different versions 
uh, of the of Scala 2, where each one of those folders contained a different implementation of a Scala 2 macros because some things change between one version of the compiler to the next. So if you have a project like that, it's fairly simple. You just have to add another another version and then you can implement the Scala 3 macro in the sources for, for the Scala 3 version. Now, for example, if we had a Scala, a Scala 2 macro like this, where we implement this power function with the macro, with the previous, with the Scala 2 syntax, and have this implementation that we don't care too much about for right now. And then we, we put this in one of the SRC for 2, to 11, to 12, to 13, um, with probably different implementations. And in the SRC for Scala 3, we can just put a different version of this power that uses the Scala 3 features. This also, we could also put other features that are available in Scala 3 that are not available in Scala 2, not only this is not only for macros. Now, later on, if you have already port, uh, migrated and are cross-compiling with Scala 2 and Scala 3, you might at some point in the future, in one, two, three years, say, okay, we're go going to completely migrate to Scala 3 and forget about Scala 2, but you still want to be cross-compatible with Scala 2, uh, 2 so that some Scala 2 projects might still use your binaries. So it is possible to, to also define in Scala 3 both, both the declarations for Scala 2, 2 macros and Scala 3 macros in the same source file, as long as they're, they have the same signature. And then there is a small caveat is that the Scala 2 implementation might still need to be implemented in Scala 2, which if you were migrating was already the case. So there is just, we just need to keep that small part is compiling with Scala 2 and the rest can be only compiled with Scala 3 and we don't have to duplicate code or uh, publishing artifacts. Now, if you're trying to migrate a, uh, a macro, the first thing you should ask is, what kind of, of replacement should, we, should, should I have? The first option, which is usually the best, is don't use a macro, because maybe the, what you were using a macro for is actually available now as a, a, as a language feature. Because we added so many features in Scala 3, many, many of the use cases of macros just got, got away. Then, if you actually need something, this next thing you should try is to use an inline, just an inline method. Because also, there is a big part of, of the, the Scala 2 macros that can be encoded just using inline without really going deep into, into macros. And if that's not enough, then we, we, we can uh, extend that inline definition and use the Scala quoted API, which is really the, the start of um, what a macro, um, the start of the definition of a macro. And if that does is not enough, then we can go down to, to, to use ASTs. And in some cases, we might need to go down to bug plugins because the use case is too complex to handle inside of a macro. So we're going to talk a bit about inlining, but with a focus on, on inlining for metaprogramming. So let's see a simple um, example here. Uh, this is a, 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 an inline definition for that is basically the assert definition that we have in the standard library, um, which states uh, it's a condition and the message, the message is a by name parameter, so we don't evaluate it straight away. And then we have some code that is intended to be inlined. So if we call it with this x equal equal one and some message, then we see that we're going to inline that code, but we're also going to generate a few definitions. So the idea here is that to make sure that the arguments that you're passing to the, this function are correctly evaluated in the correct order to make sure the first parameter is evaluated first and the second and the third and the side effects are seen in the correct order, then we will bind all those one by one and then use, use the results. We also don't want to duplicate the computation of, of by value parameters. 
And here, even though it's not really useful, we create a def for the by name, um, um, by name parameter message. Um, and this could be, one could argue that it could be in line, but the idea is if you were to use several times the message in the implementation, then you don't want to uh, duplicate the code usually, or at least not unknowingly. So if you actually wanted to duplicate the code or to not get rid of that binding, you have inline parameters. So here we made both the conditions and the message inline parameters. This means that whatever we pass will just, the code will just get duplicated wherever it's used inside of this definition. So here we don't have the, the val cont nor the val message. Uh, we just inline thing. So this behaves exactly like a by name parameter semantically because it means that it will not be evaluated before the function is called, but wherever the code is used. But with the uh, contrasting with the by name parameters, it might duplicate some code. So here there is a, a meta programming aspect already in the in the abstraction where the, it's the programmer that has to take care of not duplicating the code. Uh, and this is quite useful in macros because this also means that we can completely remove some if there, there is an argument and we don't care about it later and the macro will just consume it or partially evaluate it, then there is no trace of it in the resulting program. A bit about the semantics of inlining. So the most important thing about inlining is that it type checks before it inlines. And this makes it quite equivalent to just calling a function call from the, the perspective of, of a user of an inline definition. Because it would be if the user just calls an inline definition or an, the same definition but without inline, they would not, not, not notice any difference. This means that this is semantically equivalent to just better reducing the function. And one might think about them as the same optimization that is done in the JVM whenever the, the JVM JIT compiles the code and maybe inline some code for, for performance reasons. This, will, this has the exact same guarantees, except that it has an extra guarantee and that, that we will always inline the code. And if, we, if for, for some reason, because of some restrictions, we cannot inline, then it will be a compilation error. So you, you, you can be sure that this code was, this, this function call was removed. Inline supports uh, uh, quite a few um, things. Uh, for example, you can do recursive inlines. You can also override the, um, uh, a normal method using an inline method. You can also define a, a an abstract inline definition. It does have uh, some intricate details uh, and constraints. I won't go into them. We also have inline parameters like I talked before. Um, we also have inline conditionals like an inline if, which just ensures that the if is partially evaluated or removed from the code, which means that the condition should be known at compile time and one of the branches will be dead code eliminated while inlining. Then we have quite a lot of um, methods in the Scala compile time package that allow for uh, metaprogramming uh, without really needing to go down into macros. Those are, are kind of already implemented macros that you can use in, in inline definitions. Then we have the transparent, the, the inline, which is the, the, the new white box macros. And we also support the, the macros, of course. So let's quickly look at what a transparent inline is. It's basically the same idea as an inline, you, but you just say that it's transparent inline instead of inline. And then at the definition side, nothing will change. Just, you, you just have the same abstractions. You can use the same code and all this code will be type checked and then inlined. Here's important again, the, the, the code inside of, of the def zero will be um, type checked before it is inlined. And then once we inline, if this, this met, uh, once we inline, we will 
in this case, uh, find that because we're using some constant strings, we will be able to, to partially evaluate these if conditions and know which one exactly will be taken. And we will be left with either a zero of, of type int or a zero of type long. And then, even though the, the, the definition return an int or long, we're going to refine that to the most precise type of whatever was inlined. And that's kind of equivalent to what white box inline did. Um, and here we see one of the of the of the methods inside of compile time package, which is the error method, which if it, it, it is not removed when inlining, here we remove it because we, we usually know the that TPE will be equal to either int or long. And if we don't remove it, then there will be a, a compile time error emitted. Now macros. Macros are basically whatever is inside of the Scala quoted package. Now, just to give an idea what is the difference between an inline and a macro. So inline provides short, short code, but it, it, it needs to interpret all that code to, 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 to do simplifications and to do all the operations that it needs to do. It also has, has a quite limited functionality because the compiler needs to be able to, to run that code or evaluate that code. In contrast, macros have, are, are designed to have more explicit code where the idea is that you see clearly the difference between the code that will be evaluated at compile time and the code that will be generated for the runtime to, to run. Now, the implementation of the macros are compiled, which means that they run much faster than the inline definitions. Um, and they support arbitrary code because it's just another Scala program. Um, so to define a macro, the only thing we need to do is combine inline with quotes. So what is a quote? First, here we see that the macro is defined as a splice, the dollar sign, then inside some, some code, and then some, ref, uh, some quoted references to the, the arguments. And then we call this quote code macro implementation that receives an expert of Boolean, an expert of string, and a quote, and returns an expert of int. Expert kind of represents um, a piece of code or that has not been evaluated yet. Quotes is the context on which we, you, we do all these operations, is basically whatever the, the entry point to all our operations and will be needed everywhere where we use, where we implement something related with macros. So let's look a bit more into what's inside of this package. We have the expert type, which gives us a piece of code containing some non-evaluated code. We also have a type, which will be useful for generics, which represents a, an unerased type of any kind, as, as we see. So we, we can also uh, put higher kind of types there. We have the quote thread, which is the, the context on which we do everything. And inside of that, we have the reflect, which we'll see a bit later. So how do we handle those expressions? So here, we're receiving an expression of type Boolean, which might contain the code for true, or the code for one equals, equals one, or some other expression that will produce a Boolean. Um, the first thing we can do here is to try to get out a value out of it. If it's the, the, the constant true or false, then we should be able to get the value out. So we, we can call the, the method value on it, which will return an option of Boolean in this case. And in this case, if we don't find it, we're, we're going to, to, to generate an, a new expression that will contain the, 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 the string question with the question mark. And if we find it, then we have a Boolean that we, we know. We're going to convert it to a string. So we're going to create the string true or the string false. And then we're going to take that string and create the code that will later generate that string. But of course, here we have to always evaluate something to then to get a value to then get the code for it. But we can do a bit more 
complex code using quotes. So if we use a quote instead, we can quote some piece of code and that code will be just delayed and put into the expert. So here the quote of true will be an expert of string that will create a string later. And the quote of splice x then to string will create the code that will call to string on whatever the content of the code x is. So if x was uh, one equals equals one, then, then the code that will generate will be um, equivalent to quote x equals equal one to string. Now, if you know the syntax of, um, um, of uh, string interpolators, then you, you should be able to understand the syntax of quotes because they follow the same rules but with some extra additions. So if you have a hello world here, yeah, you're splicing the, the whatever the value of world is in both cases, either a complex express, uh, a simple reference in the first one or a complex expression in the second. Uh, in the second snippet, we see the same, but for quotes where we we're going to just insert a piece of code inside of the larger piece of code. But here we also can do it the other way around. If we have a splice, then we can quote something inside of that splice. And the syntax is just symmetrical in this case. So let's let's see where, where here uh, an example where we actually nest complex expression. Here in the last line, we see a quote that defines a value y equals three. Then we have something that will insert code based on y. So, so we basically tell, tell the method code that given this reference to this y that we just created outside, generate some code. And in this case, the code will just be x plus, uh, splice x plus one, which means that we're going to insert the y where the splice is. Of course, we cannot do reference those uh, variables any way we, we like because there are some, some illegal references that we should be avoided. For example, in the, uh, the, the pass variable, where we define here an X, and then in the quote, we're trying to assign the, the X again, but the question is when or where is this code executing? So the var X is basically executing while compiling the macro or while, while compiling and executing the macro but this, the contents of the quote will be executed in the generated application, which might not even run in the same machine. So clearly that shouldn't be allowed. And then there, there is the future variable, but it's the opposite, where we're trying to assign to y, to a y that is defined in the late, later. So this y will only exist in the in, in the compiled code, but we're trying to assign it before we actually create that code, so it makes no sense. So we also have to, to, to avoid it. Now, to avoid all those cases, there, there, there is a really simple set of rules. We call that level checking, and basically start at level zero where normal code is at level zero. And then if we go inside of a scope of a quote, we're going to increase the level by one. And if we go into the scope of a splice, we decrease the level by one. And then we can only access variables that are defined in the same level as they're used. This also, this also works if you have a quote inside of a quote inside of a quote with several levels. Now, there is a, another case that doesn't fall into those kind of restriction, which is the scope extrusion. This one is slightly more complex and usually you don't hit it as easily, but it's still good to, to know about it. So in this case, in the quote, we're defining a Y. And then inside of a splice, inside of the, of the quote, we're assigning that a reference to that Y to this X that is defined outside. So we're going to 
to have a ref af after this quote executes, we're going to drop it because we don't use the result because we are going to return X. But then X will hold a reference to that Y that is defining code that we dropped from and we're never going to be to use. So it's impossible for that Y to really refer to anything logical in the program. So that should also be avoided. In this case, what we say is that any quote or quoted piece of code should be used within the splice where it was defined and should not leak outside either by, assign, uh, by assigning an unitable variable or throwing an exception and catching it with the contents of the Y or any other side channel. And all that is checked at runtime instead of compile time. So you have, you have to test the code to, to catch those. Now, I mentioned that we had also this quote, uh, Scala coded type in the, in the API. And this is really useful when we, when we want to write generics or anything that has some abstract type, any type that is that cannot be statically known at compile time. Or in, in this case, where we have this time function that takes a T and of course will be erased. But, um, oh, it should be uh, inline def time, sorry. Um, but then inside of the, of, of the implementation, we have to, mark, to tag this T uh, with a co context bound of type to make sure that we have this information about the type that is not, not erased. And this means that we can use, use this T within any quote that refers to the T directly, like in the result, or if we insert some value that has that type T and then we infer that T somewhere in the, co in the, in the coded code. Now, on a completely different note, we also can ex pattern match on, on, on code. So in this case, we have, we, we're taking an expression of option of any, and we're trying to match to see if this expression contains an explicit none or some. And of course, if it's anything else that evaluates to a none or some, but is not statically known to be those constructors, it will just go into the default case. And here we see that whatever we, we match for the sum case, we have this X, a splice X, and we're going to extract this X out of the code of expr. And this X will just be an expr of any in this case, if the option was, uh, if the, the expr would have been option of int, then we would have a, a sum of, uh, X would be an expr of int and so on. But of course, we can do a bit more with different kinds of types. So if we want, we still get the option of any, but we actually just want to match some that matched and some content that had a sum of int, then we can do it with the first line using this n typed as int. We can also do it for generics. So if we want to match something that depends on a type that is defined as a type parameter, we can also do it as long as we have the, the type context bound. And then there is another one, which is a bit trickier, which is a type variable, where we're saying that we have sum of splice y, a type as a lowercase t. So this is important, the difference between a lowercase and an uppercase type. So if you have a lowercase, it's assumed to be a type variable. And it means that it will take the we don't, the type, the most precise type of whatever is in, the, in there. We might not know it statically, but at runtime we will have all the information that we need to know what that T is. So if we actually had an option of, uh, let's say, Boolean, then the, that T at runtime would be Boolean, but of course it is erased. So we also provide in the right-hand side of this pattern match, the, the given type of, of t to, to work as if we had the context bound for that lowercase t, the context bound of type for that lowercase t. So la, la, now let's move into reflection. So what is the reflection API? It's basically an extension of the quotes API 
Um, it provides a few different things in, in it, uh, such as error reporting. It also provides the, the, the ability to view, create uh, code based on ASTs and, and manipulate those. We also get some useful information about the, the files being compiled that is sometimes useful for, for testing frameworks, for example. Um, but we lose some static safety guarantees by accessing it. Um, now, here's an example of the reporting. Here, to, to access the reporting, we're using this quotes reflecting uh, report import. And then we can just uh, call the, the, the report. This is something that you might hit quite a lot, even if you don't really use reflection, just expression-based macros. You might just want to report something. It's the most common use of, of this uh, reflection API whenever you're not going to do something co more complex. So here, we're going to report the error. And we, we still need to re return an expression afterwards just to make sure that the, the, the code type checks. Now, you may have noticed that this import was a bit weird because I, me I mentioned that we, 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 we have everything in the package Scala quoted. I'm importing everything from it. But then I'm importing within the definition of uh, the implementation of the macro these quotes reflect. So this thing will actually, the quotes part, will look for the, the, the current quotes instance, uppercase quotes instance in scope, like if we were summoning an implicit, the implicit for the quotes. And then we're going to select the reflect on it and we're going to import everything. So this is a shorthand to, to, to access this, this parameter that we didn't name because we just used using quotes instead of using some name quotes. So we can avoid this name. And that uh, the quotes uh, alias is imported by, by importing Scala quoted star as well as everything else. And then we, when, once we import that, we can access everything inside of, of the reflection API. Here we are accessing trees. Um, now, What's in the reflection API? Do we, we have quite a lot of types in there. So whenever you import this, you, you're, you're importing all of these types and extension methods and a bunch of other stuff. So let's quickly look at some of them. So we have the trees that represent basically ASTs. Uh, typed ASTs to be more precise. So every tree has a type. Um, we have the statements that are basically anything that go, can go in a block or uh, in a class or in, um, uh, so we have the definitions, we have terms, which are what is usually inside of, of an expression. Every expression is usually a term, uh, every expression is a term, though not all terms are valid expressions. Um, then we have type trees, which represent types that are, uh, uh, written in the source file. So these type trees have uh, so position information about positions uh, uh, in the sources. Um, then we have a few things about pattern patterns that are outside of any categorization. And the other important one is probably the type wrapper, which is really what you care whenever you want to analyze something about a type or the semantics of a type, if it's a subtype, if if it's uh, what kind of type it is, if it contains a constant, if it, yeah, any kind of analysis. Selectors, which are things for, for imports and exports. Signatures, which is for uh, arrays, signatures of methods, uh, positions, source file, some constants, which are shared between types and terms. And then the, the most important here is the symbol, which is the unique definitions a representation of the definition of of a definition which is unique and can be compared. Uh, and then we have flags which are used in in, in symbols to to mark like private or things like that. 
Now, this API is defined in a slightly weird way because we 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 have we have it nested in this reflect uh, object, and then we define everything as just abstract types. And all the methods on this are defined with extension methods. And then we have also some modules that will create, do as, as companion object for those types with the constructors and the extractors for them. And we also need some type test instances that will help us um, um, type test in pattern matches. This is a simplified view of the real thing. The real thing is a bit more uh, complex. It adds, uh, it separates a bit more the, the concepts. Now, once we use it, it's much simpler uh, because we only have to import the quotes reflect and then we have access to tree. And if we have a tree, we just have to call show, which is an extension method that is just automatically imported with the type tree. So we never have to do some extra magic with it. We just we can just assume that it's a method on this on the class that will represent the tree. And then here's an example of what what, what we would do for 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 typing uh, for for pattern matching on them. We if we if we try to um, to do a type test, then we at runtime we will actually use one of these type testing that will test if a tree is of is of type select at runtime, um, you um, and we can do the same with the with the apply and unapply methods to create and construct trees. Now, one of the most uh, important parts of this API is the is how to actually get a term or a or a, or a tree out of our program. Usually when we have a macro, we get something with an expert, right? So if we have an expert, we can just transform it to a term using the as term after we imported the quotes reflect API. Then we can do whatever we want with this term. And then let's assume that we have done some transformation of this tree. Then we want to create again an expression to then put it in the program again, then we need to call the as expert of, which will, for one, will check if this expression is really typed as an int. So after we call this, we can be sure that uh, this will be an int. And it will also check that the, the term is well formed and it's actually a valid um, expression. Which, as I mentioned, not all terms are valid expressions. Mm, that's it. Hi, Nicholas. Thanks for your talk. We do have a few questions. Yeah. And I'm just going to pull them now. So it looks like we have our first question. So should, uh, we're, we're live, right? Yep, we are live. So our first question is, <laughs> macros in Scala 2 have been considered an experimental API for a long time. Are Scala 3 macros deemed ready to be used safely in production? I would say yes. The, 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 we, 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 made the, um, we made the API following uh, a couple of things. One side is the expressions, which is much uh, a much simpler abstraction and much easier to, to, to understand and reason about and make sure that it's correct. And the other side, which is the deep end, which is the problematic one from Scala 2, is the 
um, API that relates ASTs. And there, the, the, the trick to, to make it production ready is that we just follow whatever the tasty file or the canonical representation of trees that Scala tree will need to understand for all its life. Um, and just follow the same uh, same structure to make sure that that everything will just keep aligned and any change in the compiler will not break the, the macros. All right, our next question says, Nicholas, is there an API in quotes for looking up local symbols by name? I know it's probably against the macro hygiene, but it could be really handy if used carefully. Hmm. Local symbols by name. I'm not exactly sure what that means because I, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what that would entail, but I believe it's possible to do it right now but there is not a, a clean API to do it. It's possible using the trees of the definitions, but that would only work in non-transparent inlines where we can look outside of our scope, have the tree, but it's something that I would try to avoid. So it would be good to have a, a, a good discussion about what their, what their use case here is and how we could provide a, a good API that would be hygienic. Well, the screen brings up a great point before moving on to any other questions. Um, you are able to answer all the questions that we have in, with the text as well in our Hopin stage Q&A area. So feel free to go in and ask any follow-up questions and maybe our, um, our, our the, the person who asked this question will be able to clarify um, in, in, that, in that area. Wow! 